Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Yeah, I don't think Mother knew about this. Uncle Marvin was strangled by his own beard. Yep, you never saw it coming. What is with all these anniversaries? July and August, I, I guess we're popular months for wars. All that nice weather. Hello, genies. Welcome to Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, America's family history show. It's the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. I am Fisher, your congenial radio root sleuth, and this past week marked the 100th anniversary of the start of the war to end all wars, which, of course, it wasn't. World War I was, however, a great war, the Great War, and unfortunately just the appetizer for many that have come along in the century since. This week, our guest is part of a family, maybe like yours, who played parts in both World War I and World War II. Ralph Gates Sr. was in the trenches in World War I, and Ralph Jr., who joins us in about 10 minutes, is a veteran of the Second World War. But his story is anything but ordinary, and you won't want to miss this. Ralph shared some of his war experiences last year, particularly about the very special assignment he was given at the tender age of 19. And we thought you'd enjoy hearing some more from him this week. He's closing in on 90 years young, and I wish we could do a month's worth of shows with Ralph. Then later in the program, Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com, returns with tips on getting the better interview with your senior family members. This week was week two in this year's season of Who Do You Think You Are on TLC. Anyone who's into family history research loves this show, of course. Modern Family's Jesse Tyler Ferguson was the featured celebrity. And wouldn't you know... He learned that his great-grandfather was accused of murdering his, the great-grandfather's, not Jesse's, aunt. Isn't that weird how over the last few weeks we talked about ancestors involved in crimes going to jail and prison, and this is like the third story that's come along like this since then. Anyway, I won't ruin it for you. Jesse's ancestor went on to have quite a life. You can see this particular episode online at TLC.com. This coming week, Who Do You Think You Are? will feature Canadian actress Rachel McAdams. That's Wednesday night at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, and you'll have to do the math if you live someplace else. Our ExtremeGenes.com poll this week had to do with the family tradition of a sports team. We asked, do you have at least three generations that have followed the same sports team? Interestingly, it was almost an even split. 51% said yes and 49% said no. My great-grandfather, grandfather, and father all followed the old New York Giants baseball team. When they moved to San Francisco, thank goodness Grandpa didn't live to see that, the New York Mets came along. So my dad started following them, and then so did I. And still do, even though I've lived in the West for a long, long time. So that was four generations following the losing National League team from New York. It's been a harsh legacy they left me, and just talking to you about it makes me feel better. So thank you for your indulgence. This week we asked the question, were any of your ancestors adopted? Yes or no? Cast your vote now at ExtremeGenes.com. Hey, we're always looking for great stories of discovery to put on the show. If you have a great one that you've tracked down and would be willing to share it, email me at fisher at extremegenes.com or call our toll-free find line at 1-234-56-GENES. That's 1-234-56-GENES, G-E-N-E-S. You can record your story or ask us questions there. We always love hearing from you. Here is this week's family histoire news from the pages of ExtremeGenes.com. The commemoration of the 100th anniversary of World War I has begun in earnest with new books being released all over the world. One of them is called Wyndham's War, which was made from the diaries of the father of the author. 
The father, Thomas Wyndham Richards, was in Berlin for a summer vacation. He had intended to be there for four weeks. But a week and a half into this trip in 1914, the Great War began, and Richards was among the thousands of male British citizens in the country who were rounded up and sent off to a detention camp. At the time, he was a 23-year-old school teacher. Richards kept a diary of the whole experience, which, as it turned out, lasted more than four years. Richards' son, Derek, who is now 85, first found the diaries when his mother passed in 1980. When he took up an interest in family history at the turn of this century, he decided to transcribe the diaries, all 100,000 words of difficult-to-read handwriting, edit the transcripts, and then release it all as a book, Wyndham's War. Derek took years to complete the transcription because the handwriting was very small, often in faded pencil, in old German lettering, as well as modern German and English. Some, he says, is totally illegible, and other parts are simply incomprehensible. Thomas Wyndham Richards noted on August 10, 1914, We heard we must stay till the end of the war, all very down about it. The Germans had so many prisoners, they were overwhelmed and had to create an internment camp out of an old manor house a few miles west of Berlin. At one time, it had been a racetrack and was surrounded by barbed wire. There would be no escapes here. The prisoners slept on straw in old stables with about 300 people jammed in the haylofts and buildings. The Germans allowed them to manage their own affairs, in keeping with the Geneva Convention. And in time, a real society developed in that tiny piece of real estate. They even organized their own police force and post office, where Thomas Richards worked for two and a half years. Richards was released a couple of weeks after the end of the war in November of 1918. He found his way back to South Wales, where his teacher career resumed, and he married a fellow teacher, Jesse James, who he had long feared would be engaged or married to someone else by the time he returned. In the Second World War, Thomas acted as an interpreter. He died in 1966 at the age of 75. Italy has been rolling out the red carpet for New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. The mayor's been getting a fair amount of grief from folks back in the Big Apple for taking a trip abroad, but the tiny towns of Italy have given him a warm welcome. Sant'Agata de Gotti, the town where de Blasio's grandfather was born, had virtually the entire population of about 12,000 come out to greet him at a big party held on Wednesday, complete with marching band. The mayor of Santa Gata de Gatti says they just wanted the New York mayor to feel at home. De Blasio has been spending some alone time at the local cemeteries, visiting the graves of his ancestors. He's even been made an honorary citizen of the town. The local mayor even showed him documents tied to his family back in the day. You know, I've done a lot of ancestral hometown trips, and I don't recall anything like that ever happening. Here's hoping his honor is having a great experience. Of course, you can read more about these stories on our website, ExtremeGenes.com. And coming up next, his father fought in World War I, and he was part of the effort in World War II. But there was nothing ordinary about Ralph Gates' assignment late in the war when he was just a teenager. We'll talk to Ralph next on Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Your priceless 8mm home movies and your precious family videos are deteriorating right now. Heat, moisture, insects, dust, mold, time, they're all robbing you of your family's memories. It's time to preserve those treasures right now by digitizing them at tmcplace.com. They've been preserving memories for over 40 years. Home movies, videos, audio tapes, vinyl records, photos, slides, and even scrapbooks. Whether your treasures are enduring the humidity of Massachusetts or the heat of Arizona, tmcplace.com can digitize your audio and images without harming the originals and returning them to you with free shipping both ways on most orders. tmcplace.com can even let you track your package in real time with a special GPS tracking device. Trustworthy, experienced, affordable. Call tmcplace.com toll-free at 1-866-483-1717. To talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your project or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. 
questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Jeans listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. You know, there's nothing more exciting than walking where your ancestors walked and seeing what they saw. Hi, it's Fisher here, and I know I've done it. It's life-changing. And right now, Alan McKay Tours is teaming up with Ancestry Tours for a Great Britain Ancestry Tour. It's happening October 16th through 24th. Fly from your home city to London on October 16th, arriving the morning of the 17th, when you'll enjoy your first day touring England's ancient capital. If you choose, three days out of the trip are dedicated to family history research Search with professional experts in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, Scotland. You might have your own agenda in these places, but what an opportunity. Hurry, space is limited for this exciting Great Britain Ancestry Tour, October 16th through 24th. Call Alan McKay Tours today at 801-917-1131. That's 801-917-1131. Prices vary depending upon city of departure. Call now and get a $50 per person Extreme Jeans discount. Here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And, you know, there's a lot of history going on, a lot of anniversaries the last week or so and, and coming forward as well. This past week, the 100th anniversary of the start of World War I. And this coming week, the anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And we have some living history here with us today. My friend Ralph Gates, who was a part of that second story. Ralph, welcome to the show. Good to see you Thank again. Thank you. It's delighted to be here. You know, Ralph has a true military history because uh, he and his father cover both of the world wars. Now, Ralph, tell us about your dad. What was his name? He was Ralph Pillsbury Gates the first, and I'm Junior. Now, he was born in uh, 89. He graduated from college at the University of Illinois in 1912 and went to work in Chicago. And when the war came along, he volunteered and served as a part of the chemical warfare unit in France because he was a chemist by his college training. Among many things that happened to him, he was gassed twice because back then they were using poison gas, yes. although we didn't start it. And his group would be sent out early in the morning when it was still dark to set out canisters of poison gas if the wind were blowing in the right direction. And this was right out in front of the trenches. So when the signal came to go over the top, so to speak, when they came out of the trenches to go forward, supposedly the gas was always going the other way. But a couple of times he got gassed when the wind changed. What kind of effect did that have on him? Well, he died when he was 52. His heart stopped. He'd had a physical exam that day for the company he worked for, and they, I suppose they took his blood pressure, and maybe they listened to the heart it was beating and so forth, and he was pronounced okay, but he died that night suddenly. Huh. From a and, heart and you think it was the result of the gas? Well, that's what they say because they didn't know any better. And you know, you're right. You don't see much about poison gas since World War I. Hopefully never again. Right. But in fact, we have evidence of it, of course, in Syria and so forth. I had a, a cousin that was in World War I that received some gassing. And, and you know, the great Christy Mathewson, the pitcher with the New York Giants, he was gassed and, and it affected him and he died young as well. So I think there were a lot of long-term effects from that. And yes, there were. Now, you mentioned to me off air that you actually have some of Dad's diaries? Yes. Oh, yes. He, he had two diaries that he wrote when he was in the trenches in France, and I have them and have copied them. And He talks about his day experiences, and one particular time he was walking down to the mess hall, I guess, or wherever they were, and the guy next to him got hit by shrapnel, dead right on the spot. Wow. That was quite an experience, and he talks about the conditions under which the soldiers lived then were pretty bad. The, 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 the bugs and the cooties and all that were real. <laughs> and he talks about some of the experiences of that and, and being in the bombed-out shelter and getting outside because 
for whatever the reason, and then a bomb came and destroyed the shelter. He had a lot of narrow escapes like that. And, you know, World War One it was a long-running thing. It went about four years, kind of the similar well, length of World War Two. but they didn't move a lot in terms of picking up real estate either way. Once they got in those trenches, they stayed there. Of course, we didn't get in until early 1918 or maybe late 1917, 1917 yeah so we weren't in very long now ralph you've been an interviewer of many people concerning their histories especially when it comes to the military and if you were to give advice to people about how to reach out to their ancestors who were in the military those who are still with us what kind of questions would you say you should or could ask them actually the military experience is not quite as important you want the grandchildren to know what their life as individuals so, uh, first of all, I, I like to go back and say, how come your parents were where they were when you were born? Well, most of us came from somewhere else. Did they come over from Germany? or why, why did they come? Was it because they thought economically it would be an improvement? Did they come for religion? Or were they just free spirits? But they all had a passion for something different. So I would like to go back and find out about your parents, grandparents, as far back as you can go, who they were, when they came over, and why they came over, and from where they came because we all came from somewhere. I think a lot of people tend to think their lives aren't very interesting. You know, you hear that a lot. Oh, nobody wants to know about what I did, and I, I don't think that could be any further from the truth. Well, that's why I say, wouldn't you love to hear your mother or your grandfather talking live 50 years ago? Absolutely. They think, about, well, maybe that's right, but they've all had wonderful experiences, and people my age, have, you know, they, I was born before the Depression. I lived through the Depression, lived through the war. Everybody has lived in traumatic times, who's an adult today in, in the Cold War and all that. They have something to tell people about what their thoughts were, what their experiences were, that should be beneficial to hopefully keeping us out of trouble in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Although it looks rather tenuous right now. Going back to this World War I story of your father, how do you think that affected your family going forward? Well... He was with the American Legion, and everything connected with the war was very important because that was supposedly the war to end all wars. Now, I'll have to tell you one thing. This was in the summer before Pearl Harbor. We had been up in Wisconsin at a family camp, and coming back was my mother's birthday or something. We stopped in a hotel in Chicago overlooking Michigan Avenue, the old Stevens Hotel. And we had the upstairs room, I don't presidential suite or something, but it looked out over Michigan Avenue. And... I was 15 or something. About 2 o'clock in the morning, my dad woke me up. Get up. Get up. Come over here. I want you to go to the window. So my older brother and I went with him to the window, and what we heard was, brum, 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 bum, bum. Soldiers were marching down Michigan Avenue in the middle of the night. Going. This was in the summer of 41, right before that. And I remember my dad saying, we're going to be at war very soon. Wow. He sensed that. And how did that affect him, though, knowing what war is really like? Well, uh, when war was declared in, in Pearl Harbor, right after that, he was now 51 years old or something, but he was manager of a plant in Nashville. He went down to register, I think, to probably wound up being a dollar a year man. But he died in March, so he didn't do that. Never happened. Now, let, let's go back, because we had you on last year. When, I want to cover this again, because it's such a unique okay. story that you have about how you entered World War II. Now, let's just set the stage here right now. You're 89 and a half. You're almost 90 years old. Right. So you are walking history, Ralph. An icon. And, <laughs> if that's a good expression, I don't know. <laughs> but your story is so unique, because you were part of the Manhattan Project as a teenager. As a late teenager, and, yeah. and just for those who aren't familiar with it, of course, the Manhattan Project is where we developed the bomb that ultimately ended the war with Japan. How did you wind up in that situation? Well, I, I uh, graduated from high school in 1942 when I was 17, and Pearl Harbor had been the previous December, so we, we were in the war less than a year. And I started right into college that summer because if you had a chance to go to college, and you weren't going to the war, you did that. So I, I went that summer, and I went summer and winter to engineering school at Vanderbilt in Nashville, where I lived. And it was on my 18th birthday the next January that I was 18 years old. I went down to the draft board that day because I wanted to volunteer for the Army. 1943. My dad, uh, my dad had been in the Army. I wanted to join that, and they wanted to know what I was doing. I said, well, I'm in engineering school. And they said, you are? And yes, well, go home. We'll call you in a few days. And that was okay with me. So was, and they called in a few days and said, now, look, we're giving you what amounts to a, a special deferment. I think it was a 2A deferment for the convenience of the government. Stay in engineering school till we call you. 
Wow. That, that was, <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing. Well, I didn't know what it was. I figured it was very temporary. It was good to uh, be there for a while. My dad had died. So it was good to be there, and I thought it would be a matter of months or something like that. Well, actually, it was 18 months before they finally called me. So late in 44? Late in 44. It was in September 44 when they finally said, okay, we want you now. you got to go through basic training. And I was put in infantry replacement training. Now, 44, we'd already landed D-Day. We were marching across Europe as fast as we could to get to Germany. So they needed bodies. So I was in infantry replacement training. Okay. And uh, I have to say, it was kind of like Boy Scout camp. It, it was, uh, it <laughs> was, were you an eagle, by the way? An eagle no, scout? I didn't, didn't, <laughs> didn't get there. You were after I didn't that. get very far, but I had fun with the Boy Scouts. <laughs> it was kind of rough and tumble stuff. But everything, we, I mean... Taking a rifle part, a machine gun, firing at airplanes, uh, digging foxholes so tanks could grow. The one thing I didn't like about basic training was bayonet practice. Oh. Now, I knew we were training to kill and be killed. But the idea of taking that bayonet and lunging at straw dummies and so forth, that, that's, that never appealed to me. I didn't like to well, that's not natural, think is it? about doing that. But uh, anyway, it was uh, about the 8th or 10th of December of 43. 44. Or, uh, yeah, 44, when the Battle of the Bulge started. And I was down in Alabama at Fort McClellan in a 16 weeks program. And all of a sudden, the Battle of the Bulge started and they cut our training back a month. We were originally going to go out the end of January. And now we're going out the second or third of January. Now, should... this is the anticipation that the March for Germany is on. Right. And you're going to be they, a part of it. They needed that. the bodies. Yes. As far as I know, that's what I was being trained to do. Sure. But it just so happened that we were in our last bivouac in the, uh, they call them mountains in northern Alabama. It's the southern end of the Appalachian Mountains. We were camped out, and uh, I had shared my shelter half with three other guys. We made ourselves a little tent. And I remember we had two little candles. It's amazing the amount of heat you can get out of little candles when you're enclosed <laughs> like that. But it was about 4 o'clock in the morning on December 30th that the sergeant came over, and we were going to ship out in two or three days. He said, Gates, are you in there? And I said, yes, sir. Uh, he said, spoke very respectfully to sergeants. Get your stuff together. you got to go back in. What's the matter, Sarge? What's going on? Now, my dad had died. My grandfather was elderly and was ill. I thought, this is an emergency furlough. And he said, I don't know. Just do as you're told. Get your stuff together. Go over to the mess tent. you got to hike back in. I remember saying, Sarge, it's snowing like crazy outside. <laughs> we had walked out in the sun a week earlier, and it was beautiful. But this was 18 miles back. Well, he had a special assignment for you, and we're going to talk more about this when we return with Ralph Gates, World War II vet on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Hello, Extreme Genes listeners. I'm Larry Gelwix, the getaway guru and host of the Travel Show radio broadcast with the hottest travel deals on the planet. And now you can travel more and pay less by joining me on our Travel Show podcast. Cruises, tours, resort hotels, airline tickets, stay close to home or travel the world. I'll show you how to travel more and pay less. Go online to columbusvacations.com. That's columbusvacations.com. Click on radio. And then click on podcast. It's really that simple. ColumbusVacations.com, radio and podcast for the hottest travel deals on the planet. Had a brick wall in your family tree? Don't know how to break through it? Get professional help from Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. Speak directly with an experienced genealogical researcher, not a salesperson, by calling toll-free 1-877-537-2000. When you call, ask how you could win a free one-hour consultation with an expert genealogist. Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. With over 35 years of research experience, visit HeritageConsulting.com. Did you know your family's memories are being destroyed a little at a time every day. It's true. Old home movies, slides, photos, and audio recordings fade over time. The longer you delay the digitizing of these priceless artifacts, the more likely it is they'll be gone one day. That's why you need to call the Multimedia Center. I brought in VHS videotape and had them transferred to DVD. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. And 
and welcome back. It is Extreme Genes Family History Radio, America's family history show. It is Fisher here uh, getting a family history from my friend Ralph Gates, a World War II vet who, as a teenager, was called upon to work on the Manhattan Project. And Ralph, we've covered some of your history with your dad in World War I and how you were called off the training and what you thought you were going to wind up doing. Now the Sarge has called you in from the tent and said, hey, report because we've got an assignment for you. Pick it up from where you were. Right. I, I thought that I was going overseas with my buddies who all did go over about a week or two later. But I was put on a train and sent up to New York with three or four other guys and was sent to the University of uh, New York University School of Engineering up in the Bronx. And there were about 30 of us in there. And I didn't have any idea what this is about. But I found out in a hurry that in my room, there were a little suite. There were two rooms. We had three double bunks. And my bunk mate, I found out right away, was a young undergraduate from MIT. Across the road was uh, Ken Orban, who was an undergraduate from Penn State, Dick Reed from Harvard in chemistry. All of us were undergraduates in some technical training, and we didn't have any idea what we were doing. We had a wonderful time in New York, taking advantage of everything. People didn't know that we weren't coming back on furlough from overseas. So that spring, we were interviewed by a couple of civilians, old guys about 35 years old, <laughs> and uh, they divided us up into two groups. It turned out that about half of us went up to Presque Isle, Maine, and they became associated with the Air Corps at the time. Some of them became chief engineers on the B-29. The other half, which included me, we wound up at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Now, I was, my home was in Nashville. I'd never heard of Oak Ridge, but we were taken in a bus across the country, and here's this place, and it was a beehive of activity. I didn't know what was going on, but that night, I was there one night, crossing a bridge. I met a friend of mine who'd graduated a year ahead of me in chemical engineering at Vanderbilt, and I said, Hugh, what in the world are you doing in this awful place? <laughs> and I remember what he said. I'm dogged if I know. I know what I do, but I don't know what I'm doing. Now, this is how secret everything sure. was. Now, the people at the higher levels knew what this is about, but he knew that's what they're doing with all these centrifuges and stuff like that, but he didn't know what it was for. Well, the next day, I was put on a Pullman car with about 15 or 20 other guys. We were sealed up. We headed west, and I thought we were heading for the Pacific. But on the train, I found out later on, we had all our meals brought into us. We were not allowed off the train. Everything was very secret. Wow. Found out later on that at, at appropriate stops along the way, the train went from Knoxville up to Louisville, transferred our Pullman car to another train, took us over to St. Louis where our car was transferred to what turned out to be, I think, the uh, Santa Fe chief. So they kept attaching your car to different trains. Yes. And, you and were keeping out. us inside all yeah. the time. Wow. Found out that along the way, this one guy, Corporal Hull, made a telephone call and said, this is Corporal Hull reporting, my shipment is intact and no one has approached us. Very well, get back on the train. This is so they made sure that no one what was going on. The train stopped at Lamy, New Mexico, outside Santa Fe, and the rest of it went on, and we waited till we were picked up by a bus. Where are we going? Where are we going? You'll find out. Shh. You'll find out. You'll find out. Pretty soon I saw a sign that says Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'd heard of that. Never been there. It must be a military base around here somewhere. Well, of course, we went on through, went up to Espanola, crossed the, the Rio Grande River, and the only bridge that was capable of handling it, turned off on a road and went up into the mountains, and here was a big fence and a big sign, Los Alamos Ranch for Boys. <laughs> uh, and that's the first, first time I'd heard of it. Now, the next morning, I was called in for a, a briefing because once you got inside the fence there, you were not going to get out till the war was over, and they told us exactly what we were doing. General Gross, who was the overall in charge of this, of course, wanted to keep everybody doing their own thing without knowing, hoping to keep information from getting out. But Oppenheimer said, up here, you got all these temperamental super scientists working. you got to let them cross-fertilize each other if you're going to get this job done. So the minute we got up there, we were told exactly what we were doing. We were building a new type of bomb. And I remember we'd been dropping two-ton blockbusters on Germany and could pretty well destroy it if you had 50 planes at the time and you did it 10 times. Anyway, we're building a bomb that's equivalent to more than 10,000 tons of TNT in one blast. Compare that with a two-ton blockbuster. It was hardly believable as far as I'm concerned. But so what did they have you doing? Because well, you're, you're I, just I a team. Well, I transferred the next day out to S-Site, which was out of ways because we were melting TNT in sugar kettles and pouring castings which were shape charges, which surrounded plutonium in the fat man, the second bomb. Now, this, this sounds kind of dangerous. Well, uh, fortunately, TNT melts below the boiling point of water, so as long as we kept the temperature below that, we were in no <laughs> trouble. But just in case, they had built great big earthen dams around us. In case we had a little explosion, they didn't want collateral damage sure. killing any of the important people elsewhere. So 
and we never did have that. We cast those things until the war was over. And so when the day came where you heard that the bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima, now that was not the bomb you worked on. Right. What were your thoughts? Wonderful. The war may be over. When it dropped on Nagasaki, it was over. Then we really celebrated, and we really knew that this thing had worked, and it was a great experience. Talk about some of these experiences that you had uh, while you were on the base, people that you worked with, people maybe you were in touch with the rest of your life, and what kind of context? I mean, there's been a lot of debate about the moral side Oh, of, yes. of bombing a civilian population, even though, of course, they were all workers on military base there. Yeah. Has that affected your viewpoint on it, looking back over time? Uh, it hasn't affected my viewpoint. I, I think maybe it has affected some others because I've, I've given a talk on this quite frequently, and I'm asked that question. Was this the right thing to do, or should we not have done that? Well, my answer to that is I prefer to look at it mathematically. Was it correct or incorrect? Okay. And here's where there's no question that it was the correct thing to do because a tremendous number of lives is saved. So I'd say something can be morally wrong, but the correct thing to do. And Interesting. That usually satisfies that because I, where I grew up in Nashville, five of my closest neighbors right around us didn't make it back. And their mothers had gold stars in the windows. My mother didn't. My older brother was in the Air Corps, but he had a science job and didn't get overseas either. So of all neighborhood, we had no gold stars in our window. Now, when I was growing up, we had a, a neighbor who had uh, worked for the government, and he told us some stories because he, too, was involved, in this case, in the transfer of the bomb for Hiroshima, and he rode in a boxcar, literally handcuffed to the bomb with one other person, and they didn't want to put a group of military people there for fear of attracting attention. Right. But they went all the way across the country with this bomb in the train, they talked about stopping at one point where they got out and said, hey, we got to keep going. We got something hot here. Oh, well, they, and, they said that. I'm yeah, surprised. <laughs> and, the, and the guy pointed at the car behind him and said, oh, you think yours is hot? You ought to see that. And it was labeled, <laughs> it was labeled torpedoes. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they took it all the way to the end of the line safely, obviously. And that's where it wound up on the plane with Paul Tibbetts and his crew. That, that was the Enola Gay. Right? Exactly. One other story from this man that you might find interesting. Part of his job was to actually break into Oak Ridge and steal all the secrets he could on behalf of the government to see and test their security. And he went in there every day for over a week. And by the end of the time, the security guards were saluting him as he walked by. <laughs> he was able to write an inch and a half thick dossier on everything that was going on in there. And that resulted in a lot of changes in their security. Well, the security was very good, but we did have some spies anyway. Klaus Fuchs was one of the spies that took so much back to Russia. He was born and raised in Germany, but he was a communist. As far as Hitler was concerned, I guess communists and Jews were all pretty much the same. He was a wonderful physicist, and he went through England, back to here, and he was at Los Alamos and very well received up there. But he was passing this information on to Russia because he wanted communism to get rid of Hitler as much as anybody else did. So it was kind of a mixed reason. He was a spy, and he did go to prison for a few years in England. They almost apologized for it because they realized what he was doing was try to get rid of Hitler as well as we were. Well, Ralph, it has been a joy to have you on again. And you are living history, and you know there's no separation. You cannot separate history from family history, and, and your family's is remarkable. Thank you so much for your time, Ralph. Good to see you again. Happy birthday in advance for January. I'm looking forward. I hope I get an invitation. Number 90. Why don't you come skiing with I'm me? I'm planning on it. <laughs> and coming up next, Tom Perry, our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com on Extreme Genes Family History Radio. You know, when it comes to family history, there's nothing quite like the thrill of the hunt and the excitement generated by every new discovery. Who were your immigrant ancestors? What ship did they come over on? Why did they come when they did? Did they participate in any military campaigns that took place in their day? What personal challenges did your forefathers and mothers endure? Heritage Consulting, Genealogy Research Services can get you the answers to many of these questions and more. They've been providing professional research and consultation services since 1970. Call toll-free 1-877-537-2000 to speak directly to a professional family history researcher. Heritage Consulting can research, collect, 
analyze and interpret the countless documents your ancestors generated throughout their lives and present the findings to you in an attractive book or in an electronic format. The cost, far less than you'd expect for far more than you can imagine. 877-537-2000 or go to heritageconsulting.com. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Genes listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. You know, there's nothing more exciting than walking where your ancestors walked and seeing what they saw. Hi, it's Fisher here, and I know I've done it. It's life-changing. And right now, Alan McKay Tours is teaming up with Ancestry Tours for a Great Britain Ancestry Tour. It's happening October 16th through 24th. Fly from your home city to London on October 16th, arriving the morning of the 17th, when you'll enjoy your first day touring England's ancient capital. If you choose, three days out of the trip are dedicated to family history Research with professional experts in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, Scotland. You might have your own agenda in these places, but what an opportunity. Hurry, space is limited for this exciting Great Britain Ancestry Tour, October 16th through 24th. Call Alan McKay Tours today at 801-917-1131. That's 801-917-1131. Prices vary depending upon city of departure. Call now and get a $50 per person Extreme Jeans discount. Here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. He's Tom Perry. He's our preservation authority from TMCPlace.com. You can always ask Tom at TMCPlace.com. And Tom, we have a question today from Becky Freeman in Atlanta, Georgia. She says, Dear Tom, I really enjoy your tips on family history preservation. You discussed a $500 camcorder that was waterproof that could be used for snorkeling and at the beach. Oh, that was so cool. I missed the model number. I don't own a computer or cell phone, so I can't re-listen to the podcast you talk about. So for that very reason, I am writing you this letter. Please let me know the make and model number for this video camera. Thanks, Becky. Okay, the model number is the JVC model GZ. R70, G is in green, Z is in zebra, R is in Robert, 70. Consumer Reports tested it to a depth of 16 feet in their August 2014 issue. So if you can get that out of your library or if it might still even be on the newsstand, I'll have some more information about it. The highlights of this camera, which is really incredible if you didn't hear us talk about it a few weeks ago, it's high definition. As we just mentioned, it's waterproof to a depth of at least 16 feet, not water resistant. That's so fun. Waterproof. Yeah, waterproof. Take it snorkeling. Yeah. <laughs> Take it to the beach, any place you're going to have it's salt, so dust, anything. Once you get back from the desert, just squirt it off. If you ran it through your dishwasher, not on the heat mode, <laughs> that would probably clean it too. But don't put the heat mode on, you'll ruin it. So it's high def. It has a 40X optical zoom lens, which means you can bring things 40% yeah. closer it has 180 minutes of battery life. It has an image stabilizer. So if you're moving a lot, it'll kind of fix your images. And it has a 3-inch LCD touchscreen lens. It also has a 3-inch LCD touchscreen monitor. So it's a good size. So you can pretty yeah. much see what you're shooting, the fish and the, you know, whatever, whatever you're doing when you're is. snorkeling. That's great. But the one thing that people might not understand, too, is this isn't just for underwater use. Like I mentioned, if you're going to be out on the desert taking your four-wheelers out or something— it's a good camera to use there because if it's waterproof, it's going to be sandproof to an extent. And one thing, too, I always, always, always recommend is buy either a clear or a UV filter to go on the front of the lens. Because if you're out in the desert and the sand's blowing, you're going to ruin your lens. If right. you put a filter on that's $20, $25, that gets scratched up, throw it away, put a new one on. 
Yeah, great advice, of course. So you should never, ever touch a coated lens with anything. So that's why everybody that ever buys any kind of camera should flip for the 20 bucks for a filter on the front of it. Okay. It just helps tremendously. I got something really, really cool to tell you about. Okay. Home Depot is going to be selling 3D printers. Shut up. Oh, they are. Wait, wait a minute. Now I'm jumping ahead a little here because I'm thinking if Home Depot is carrying them, prices are going to be dropping like a rock. Yes? Oh, they do. They do. And the neat thing about it, you can go in and handle them. If you have problems, you can get the warranty service taken care of at Home Depot. And even better than that, when you need supplies, you run down to Home Depot and get them. Oh, that's great. So convenient. Oh, and it is. Usually, you run out of red. Used to be you had to order them from someplace and they'd ship them to you. Oh, it's just great. So you run out of red and go, oh, no, I got to wait two or three days to get some more red. Run down to Home Depot and pick it up. And, you know, we were talking not long ago about this, Tom. I think off the air. I'm not sure. <laughs> Lots of conversations exactly. continue at different times about the idea of getting a photograph and making a 3D map of it and then creating a 3D image of an individual out of something. So you could make a little statuette, perhaps, of oh, one yeah. of your ancestors. Oh, absolutely. Just like you saw in Star Wars with Princess Leia where she's this hologram type thing. This is basically the predecessor to that, because once we have the way to take that photograph, make it 3D, make an image out of it, holograms are going to be right around the corner. And then you can make something solid from it. How amazing would that be? Oh, it'd be so cool. Like we talked about getting Grandpa's watch and scanning it. This way you can take Grandpa's photo, make it 3D, and actually print a statue or a bust of him. (laughs) That's nuts. It is. It's just absolutely crazy. All right. Coming up in just a few minutes, we continue. What are we going to talk about? Well, last few weeks we talked about how to make your audio sound better. We're going to talk about how to make your interviews sound better. Ah, good choice. All right. Coming up next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Hello, Extreme Jeans listeners. I'm Larry Gelwix, the getaway guru and host of the Travel Show radio broadcast with the hottest travel deals on the planet. And now you can travel more and pay less by joining me on our Travel Show podcast. Cruises, tours, resort hotels, airline tickets, stay close to home or travel the world. I'll show you how to travel more and pay less. Go online to columbusvacations.com. That's columbusvacations.com. Click on radio. And then click on podcast. It's really that simple. ColumbusVacations.com, radio and podcast for the hottest travel deals on the planet. And we're back. Final segment of Extreme Genes Family History Radio, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is our preservation authority. And Tom, the last couple of weeks, we were talking about audio for interviews with the old folks, the great aunts, the grandparents. And uh, this week, let's talk about getting better interviews, not just technically, but in terms of getting better answers. Well, absolutely. As you mentioned last few weeks, we were talking more about equipment, what kind of equipment to use, how to set it up. But yeah, now that you have the equipment, now what do you do? Well, and the the question is always, what's the question? What do you ask people? And I have people ask me this all the time. What do you say to grandma or grandpa to get them to open up? Because sometimes they see the equipment and they freeze. They do. In fact, I've always told people in our store when they've asked how to do this, I say, set up your camera, cover up the little red tally light so they don't know it's on, and just say, hey, let's practice this first, and then we'll start recording in a few minutes. And your practice, you're really running hot, and that's when you get your best answers. Yes. And, you know, you're really as responsible for what they're going to get to you as they are by, oh, what, absolutely. by what you ask. Oh, exactly. And I tell people, do not ever ask a question that could be answered yes or no. Yeah, no so kidding. all you're going to get is a yes or no. That is so fundamental to it. But you might want to sit down and map out a list of questions beforehand. Don't exactly. go in there unprepared. Map out ideas about their childhood, about when they were courting, when they met, things along those lines. I tell people, ask direct questions that will get your interviewee to go into depth about subjects and stories. And you can always edit out content. If you have too much, 
edit it out. You can't put something there that's missing. So let them ramble. Let them just go ahead and go because they might trigger something else in their mind while they're rambling. And you're going to go, oh, wow, I didn't know about that. And so let them ramble. Another thought on this is that if you can do it in more than one session, you're going to find that they're thinking about things a little in between sessions. Or maybe you can even give them the questions in advance so they can be thinking about it and maybe come up with some other thoughts besides what you've provided. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. You give them a list of questions, they can get out a ledger pad and kind of answer their questions so they were fresh in their mind. And one thing funny, too, about doing multiple sessions, which we recommend, you'll find the answers change a little bit. (laughs) Yes, they do. Or they don't quite agree on how they remember them. Oh, exactly. Oh, it's funny. I remember things. I'm talking to my sister. We're watching my dad's old home movies on the DVD player, and she's going, oh, da-da-da-da-da. And I'm going, no, that wasn't that way. It was this way. Oh, yes, it is. You know, that's why you get multiple sources and go with the majority. But, you know, the funny thing about that is just these stories as they're remembered become part of your history as well. Even if it's a family legend and, and it's not true and you can prove it's not true, the fact that people embrace this thing over many generations potentially, it makes for an interesting piece of your own history. It's just like the old story about meatloaf. Little Donna says, why do you cut off the ends of the roast, Mommy? Well, that's the way I was taught. That's the way Grandma taught me. So she goes to Grandma. Grandma, why do you cut off the ends of the meatloaf? Well, because that's the way my Grandma taught me. Great Grandma, why do you cut off the ends of the meatloaf when you cook it? Because our pan was too small. It wouldn't fit. (laughs) And as silly as that is, there are stories that are just handed down like that. That's right. Why do you do that? Well, because Grandma taught me that. Well, why did Grandma teach you that? I have no idea. Because the pan was too small. But they just keep doing it, perpetuating the same thing, thinking that's the way you're supposed to do it. Isn't that interesting? It well, I, I remember having a story passed down the line about some ancestor that left a fortune to a couple that left to America, and he had actually cut them out of the will originally, changed his heart because he loved his daughter. But she had left, and when he changed his will and died, she never knew. And so supposedly all the descendants of these people over the years were going to come into all this money. So the lawyers were lining up all these folks back in England over this estate that never really existed. It was kind of a scam. But it was still written in one of the family histories that this was the case for our family. And we found out it wasn't true. But nonetheless, the story itself, even though it wasn't accurate, was still a fascinating thing to have. Great conversation. Thanks, Tom. You bet. We'll do some more next week. That wraps it up for this week. Thanks once again to Ralph Gates for joining us with his story about being a teenager on the Manhattan Project. Catch the podcast starting Monday on iTunes and iHeartRadio. Take care. We'll see you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.